Thank you, Dr. Ross. Um, I am going to take care of the rest of the referendum items for the high school. There are 11. And I'll also take care of the one referendum item for the 7th and 8th grade. So, again, thank you for your attention. Um, you've just heard a presentation on Issue 1B. Before I get started, again, thank you for everything that you do for the young people that are in your schools. And, and thank you also for those of you that help us so much here in the Northwest District with tournaments as well as for our, our regional and even our state events. Let's look at 2B, and what I'm going to give you is just a summary of these issues, and I'm going to try to proceed pretty quickly in the interest of time. I do encourage you, before you vote, to go to the section of your handbook that's entitled High School Referendum, and then the 7th and 8th grade referendum, you'll see the complete text and the comments, so it would probably be good for you to take a look at that, but what I'm going to do is give you sort of the cliff notes or the synopsis, and we're starting with 2B. This is to add an exception to 431. 431 is that bylaw that says... You have to be enrolled and attending a school full-time in order to be, um, have the privilege of athletics. And there are quite a few exceptions. And as Dr. Ross alluded to, our General Assembly has become a lot more politically active in the business of the Athletic Association. So by adding this particular exception, it would allow us to cover any subsequent changes that the General Assembly might make to this particular bylaw in terms of enrollment attendance. As you know, in July, we have um, an issue that now allows a home-educated student to be eligible at the public school in the District of Residence, as well as non-public school students whose uh, schools don't sponsor a particular sport to be eligible, again, in the District of Residence of the parents at the public school. What's on the horizon is community school, so we're watching that um, very carefully. That's issue 2B. 3B is still in that same section with enrollment attendance. This has to do with graduate graduation. We've just uh, revised 435 a little bit to make it very clear that we're talking about domestic students within the United States and to stipulate that once they've completed the work for graduation and are declared a graduate, that their eligibility ceases. And this is regardless of whether they have semesters of eligibility left and they're still age appropriate. We felt that we needed to sort out the international situation because we've had some, some cases where we feel that we really need to apply some discretion. This one, this new bylaw 436, would address students who are educated outside the USA. And again, they're considered graduates when they complete the requirements for compulsory education in their country. It might be different than what it is in the United States, but yet this would still allow for an exception for a student who has not met the substantive academic admission requirements for a college in the United States. 4B, these changes are mostly editorial, but we do like to present you editorial changes for your approval. The first one in 444 would just be to add the word immediately to modify preceding grading period, and that would make this bylaw, which is in the 7th and 8th grade realm, consistent with 445, which is also the 7th and 8th grade bylaw, and 441, which is the basic high school scholarship bylaw. 447, this has just been reworded to indicate that summer school and other educational options cannot be used to bring a student into compliance with any of those scholarship bylaws. 5B, we're now moving into the residence section. 463 is that bylaw that's been in place for many, many years, and it stipulates that if your parents don't live in the state of Ohio, then you're not eligible for the privilege of athletics participation. Exception 2 has been in this bylaw for a very long period of time. We think it needs to be just rewritten for clarity. The substance has not changed, but it's rewritten to clarify that if a student's parents move outside Ohio after the student has been enrolled in attending a minimum of 15 days at the beginning of the 11th grade year, then that student remains eligible at that high school for that entire rest of the, ninth, or the 11th grade year and the senior year as long as they maintain continuous enrollment and, of course, are eligible in all other respects. It doesn't quite read exactly like that. We think this is just to clarify that. And then exception four, we've had some questions about what it means to start at the beginning of fourth grade, so we're just going to add the word beginning. This exception is about 25 years old, and it allows a student who's been in the same parochial system of education beginning with grade four, whether that elementary school is out of state or whether it's in state, but the parents live out of state, to enroll in 
a high school of the same system and be declared eligible for their high school year. So we're just clarifying that it's the beginning of the fourth grade through eighth grade continuously to have that privilege. 6B, as you know, the transfer bylaw changed this year. Two major changes. One was the reduction in the sit-out period from one year to the first 50% of the regular season. And secondly, no consequence whatsoever for a student who did not participate in a sport in the previous 12 months. So what this editorial revision does is just clarify to make sure that everybody knows that you're not eligible if you transfer and you don't meet an exception until all contests, or you're not eligible for all contests until the first 50% of that regular season has been competed in any sport that that student would have played in the previous 12 months. We're also adding a note to this, and, and we're interpreting this for you right now because we get questions about it. If you have a student that has transferred during a season of the sport and has played football, for instance, and as you know, bylaw 473 does restrict that student from any further participation at your school in that sport. If that happens to the student, we don't want that student to have to sit out more than 50% of the regular season. So this note has just been added to clarify that what they would be sitting out under 473 and in the next season shall not be more than 50% of the regular season. So we now have that in writing in the bylaw. Still in transfer, 7B, this is within exception one, and exception one, does uh, deal with the parent's bona fide move. This is one of the ones that we would want to make effective immediately. The first minor change is to make consistent that whether or not you're moving from public school A to public school B within Ohio or from outside of Ohio into a public school district, your choice remains the same. The public school in your new district of residence or any non-public school. So we needed to clean that up. And then in addition, we would like a provision within this bylaw to give us some ability to extend conditional eligibility. We have situations in which one parent's got to make the move right away, and the other parent, this is when the marriage is intact, has to stay behind maybe to take care of business, get the house sold, whatever it is. So we would be able, under this provision, to give up to 90 days of conditional eligibility when those residences are more than 100 miles apart. Usually it's from out of state, but not always. Could be from Cincinnati to Toledo, for example. But this provision would make it easier, we think, on families that are making this move from a fairly great distance. And then 8B, also within um, the transfer bylaw, this would be under the change of custody. And this would be effective nearly immediately right after the referendum again, would permit us some discretion. Occasionally, we have students who are of the age of majority and they're no longer under the jurisdiction of any court. If they are 18, of course, they can't get a change of custody, but sometimes they have to move and establish a residence with a parent in a new school district. So when we have such a situation, this would give us the option to have some discretion in the case of those students who have those kinds of extenuating circumstances through no fault of their own. 9B in transfer, again, just a clean up. Exception three, this is the exception that deals with schools closing or discontinuing their programs after grade nine. And this exception would make it clear, this addition would make it clear that this exception refers to once you've enrolled in your new high school, after your school closes, your eligibility is at that high school only. We would also add two notes to this particular exception. The first one, directing members to bylaw 474 if it's a closing of a high school within a multiple school district. And 474 gives the superintendent of that district some jurisdiction for moving students within that multiple high school district. And then note two, adding that this exception is not applicable to the closing of, quote, non-traditional schools such as community schools or those 08 schools, those non-chartered, non-public schools. And those are schools that open at close at will. If you go onto the State Department website, you don't know whether that listing is accurate because those schools do come and go fairly frequently. So this exception is not available for those types of schools. 10B, this is new. 
We have an appeals panel, as many of you, I think, are aware. Um, we've been very pleased with the panel and the way that it has been working and certainly has taken some burden off of our board of directors. But they do hear cases that they just aren't able to accommodate because there isn't anything within our bylaws that gives them the discretion. This particular issue, 10B, deals with um, a situation that is quite prominent. Um, some of the claims are legitimate, some are not. But this exception to deal with cases of severe harassment, intimidation, and or bullying that can be clearly documented would be something that we would ask for your approval in terms of giving us some discretion. We lay out within this exception exactly what we would need in order for us to consider granting uh, a waiver of the transfer bylaw for students who are so situated. And that would be a specific detailed report of the prohibited incidents, an outline of procedures used to respond to and to investigate any complaint, a copy of the findings of the complaint, an outline of the procedures used to respond and to investigate that complaint, a specific detailed disciplinary procedure for any individual that's found guilty, all reports of notification, to parents of any student involvement and a report of the intervention strategies and remedial action of the school to help assist the student and to redress the complaint. When we were in Dayton last week, talked to a principal who said, you know, I had a call on Monday from a parent who wanted me to deal with a student that was bullied at Kings Island. Well, I, I really don't think that this is what we're talking about. We're talking about pervasive, persistent, severe cases that are well documented that you just simply can't protect the student and perhaps a transfer would be advisable. So that would be issue 10B. 11B in bylaw 493, this deals with mass marketing and open houses. Um, restricting open houses to just the high school has been viewed as just too cumbersome, too restrictive. This change would allow open houses to be conducted elsewhere in a location that is open to the general public. It's not a private club, not a private home, not a private room within a public facility, and it would require a request for a waiver from the member school to use that alternative site. Then within the same bylaw, mass marketing, invitations to attend high school events. This amendment would clarify that any invitation extended to come to a high school athletic contest or an event such as a banquet or recognition ceremony would have to be extended to an entire group or team and then mutually agreed upon by the administration of both organizations. That's not a change. What we are attempting to do is clarify some things that have been problematic that are not permissible for you to do within the context of this permissible event. And that would be things such as running onto the contest venue with a team, visiting the locker room before or after the contest, having a pregame meal with that team, viewing the contest from the playing area. And those are your high school issues. Again, I encourage you to read the entire text and the comments that are included both on our website and within your booklets today. How many seventh and eighth grade folks do we have here? I know we have Mr. Catafias over here. We got a few, that's great. This will be coming to you and I just got word from the office that the ballots went out first class mail this morning. So you should be getting them very shortly in your um, schools. This is issue 1B, grades 7 and 8. This is not something that is new in terms of consideration and discussion. I've been doing this for 25 years, and this issue comes up time and time again. It now has the approval of the Board of Directors as well as the recommendation from the Junior High Committee, and that is to adopt a new bylaw within 434. Remember, Section 3 is the Enrollment and Attendance section. And this deals with semesters, limitation on semesters for the 7th and 8th grade. It reads, after a student completes grade 6 and before entering grade 9, the student may be eligible for a period not to exceed four semesters. There has been concern about redshirting. You all hear it. You report it to us. We tell you that there really isn't anything that we can do about it. We hope that this would discourage that practice. If you can't play, may not be a reason for you to repeat grade eight. It may deter discontinuing membership in order to circumvent this bylaw, and we've had that in some of our both public districts as well as non-public. And then this concept is consistent with the high school 
eight semester rule. The last thing, these are just some of the bylaws that were approved, major ones for 13-14. I'm not going to review those for you. They're in your packet and on your uh, agenda as well as, of course, in your handbook. And I am going to turn this over to Mr. Snodgrass. Thank you so much for your attention.